that. Amen. All right, we're going to cover some ground, so we've got to move along. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Joel, chapter 2 with me tonight. Joel, J-O-E-L, Old Testament prophet, chapter number 2, verses 30 through 31. I want to start with you tonight talking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an Old Testament revelation of coming judgment. Then we're going to move into the day of Christ and the catching away of the saints of God and what's going on right now while we're standing here in this building. Joel chapter number 2 verses 30 and 31. The scripture says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible, note carefully, day of the Lord come. You can be seated. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name, amen. The day of the Lord is a constant theme running all through the Old Testament scripture, pointing toward a coming day of judgment, darkness, and gloom. For example, the Bible says in Malachi chapter number 4 and verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he told them, he said, Elijah has already come if you'll receive him. And they said, who in the world are you talking about? He said, they, he said that John the Baptist is Elijah if you will receive him. Therefore, that meant that the day of the Lord was imminent at that time, about to appear. But of course it did not. God pushed it off and held it in abeyance. So a lesson to learn, folks, one of the greatest lessons to learn about interpretation of Scripture, especially as it relates to prophecy, especially as it relates to eschatology, and that's this. God can start a thing, stop it, pick it up somewhere else, and start it again. God counts the way He counts. So it doesn't necessarily mean that anything has to move consecutively from the time that it starts until it's brought to complete fruition. So remember that tonight. It'll be a great blessing for you. 2,000 years ago, John the Baptist could have been Elijah that was prophesied in the book of Malachi who would come before the day of the Lord. But he wasn't. But he could have been. So that's important to understand. The book of Revelation chapter number 6 and verse 12 says in relation to the moon turning to blood, And I beheld when he would opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So the book of Revelation gives you a clear fulfillment of Joel's prophecy right before the coming of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a period that spans 1,007 years. It's a long period of time. It includes the millennium, but it also includes the tribulation period. So it runs for 1,007 years. The day of Christ that we'll get into in just a few minutes is an entirely different thing. It is not nearly as long as the day of the Lord, and it, is, and it, is, and it focuses on a small group of people. The day of the Lord is worldwide, but the day of Christ is focusing on a small group of people, particularly the body of Christ, which is small small in comparison to the size of the world. In Matthew chapter number 24 verses 29 and 30 the Bible said immediately, After the tribulation of those days shall, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There is no way folks that you can cram the church into Matthew chapter number 24. Who is that then preacher? That's Israel. The Jewish people that's going to be here during the tribulation period. It's always easy to understand to help you understand the seven years of tribulation if you'll call it what the Old Testament calls it. The time of Jacob's trouble. That's referring to Israel. Then in 2 Peter chapter number 3, now notice the comparison when Peter talks about the same thing. 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
So it's obvious from Scripture that particular portions of the day of the Lord are referred to in the generalization of saying day of the Lord. The day of the Lord could be a reference to the whole period of time. It could be a reference to a specific event during the period of time. It could be a reference to the people in that period of time. So the day of the Lord spanning a period of a thousand and seven years, folks that's a long time, can cover a lot of things. The Apostle Peter, New Testament, note carefully, makes a direct reference to the day of the Lord. Peter's mind, therefore, he is saying, it is yet future. The day of the Lord was something that Peter says is going to come. And according to what Peter said, it's not going to be a pretty sight. According to what Peter said, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. It is the day of judgment of the creation and the creature. So the day of the Lord is something coming. It's something that was well known and fully understood by every Old Testament saint at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to understand that the day of the Lord was something they had been versed in from day one. They understood it. They knew it was going to happen. Now here's another key scripture. In the book of John chapter number 11 and verse 24, when the Lord Jesus Christ came to the tomb of Lazarus on his way, he met Martha. And here's what happens. Matthew, John eleven twenty four. 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Was she incorrect in believing that there is a resurrection at the last day? No, but that's all she knew. And I point that out to you tonight to understand that's all she knew. She didn't know anything about what was revealed to the Apostle Paul about a great mystery, and God revealed it to this man. Why did he reveal it? Because the mystery is something that applies directly to us as the church of the living God. The church of God was not in the Old Testament. The church of God was something that came into existence during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said himself in Matthew chapter number 16, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is still here. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. It is, my friend, his love, and he's coming for his love. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, when God had revealed to the Apostle Paul the great truth of the rapture, he said this in chapter 5. He says, We have not been appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. The wrath he's talking about in 1 Thessalonians 5 is not hell. It's talking about the tribulation period that's going to come upon the earth to try all flesh that's alive upon the earth. This is why the Lord said in Matthew 24, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. Don't ever let anybody tell you we're in the tribulation. This is, this is, this is Sunday school compared to what's coming in the tribulation. When the tribulation period hits this earth, it's going to be the most horrendous thing this world has ever known. And believe me, folks, when the Bible talks about great tribulation, it's not, making, it's not making a joke about it. It's not making light of it. It is something real that's coming to planet Earth. Now, what I was involved in bringing about the, the cosmic changes, the, the catastrophes, the cataclysmic events, and all the stuff and all of that's involved with that, that's in the hand of God. God can do it any way He pleases. But believe me, the waters are going to turn to blood. The forest is going to burn up. And men are going to cry out to die, and death will flee from them. The bottomless pit is going to open up, and out of that pit is going to come horrendous, horrid creatures that the earth has never seen before. And all of these things are coming now. They're getting ready now to come upon the face of the earth. Understand, folks, I was listening to a three-star general today, lieutenant general. Now, folks, that's high up. There's only one star above that. And only four stars is all they've got today. No more five-star generals. But this three-star general said this. The, the, the uh, what's his name, Chris uh, Wallace asked him, said, uh, how long will it be, uh, general, before we get into these war? The general said, we're already in them. We're not, it's nothing coming. We're in it now. And he said, people need to understand this stuff is happening right now while we're talking. And it is, folks. So the time of tribulation, 
The time of Jacob's trouble is beginning to unfold before your very eyes. You're watching, you're watching a conflagration take place in the Middle East that we have never witnessed in my lifetime and in a long time. And it's happening, and it's going to happen on a on more frequent basis. It's coming, it's here, and it's something that we've got to deal with. Yeah. What is it, preacher? It is the coming of the day of the Lord. Please get, please get that. It's the coming of the day of the Lord. Well, you say, preacher, are we not already in the day of the Lord? No, we are going to be spared from the day of the Lord. That's what the next thing is in this message tonight. We are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So Martha said, he'll, be, he'll rise in the last day. The Lord Jesus looked at her and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not a day or a place. It's a person. Salvation is not a thing or a sacrament. Salvation is a person. The grace of God is not something sat here, some ethereal thing. The grace of God is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the grace of God given to mankind. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Therefore, if you have the Son, you have eternal life. For the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal life. The Apostle John says, and we saw him eternal life, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is eternal life. Hallelujah to God. So the day of the Lord, and I know there's a whole lot more that could be said, but I got a lot to do. So the day of the Lord is something that is certainly a doctrine of the Old Testament, fully understood at Christ's time. The Apostle Peter himself talked about the day of the Lord as an event that is coming down the road. But in 1 Corinthians chapter Chapter number 15, verses 51 through 52, the Apostle Paul says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. Why is it a mystery? It's a mystery because it was not known. It's a mystery that was revealed to him. What is the mystery? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, if you're thinking about a resurrection, a general resurrection, if you're thinking about the day of the Lord and the resurrection of the day of the Lord that Martha was talking about, that's no mystery. That's no mystery. Everybody understood that. The Apostle Paul obviously is making reference to something that was not part of what they understood from Scripture. Why? Because what he's talking about is a direct reference to we, us, body of Christ, bride of Christ. We are his. We belong to him. He belongs to us. I am his and he is mine. Amen. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God raise from the dead. I messed up, didn't I? What did he say? He'll bring them with him. They're not sleeping out here in the graveyard. For this we send you with the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a mystery. That's the mystery of the catching away of the saints of God. And the apostle says in 2 Thessalonians 2, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and gathering together into him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now he's introduced a new term. What's the day of Christ? Well, the rapture, the catching away of the saints of God is instantaneous. It's finished. But the day of Christ is something that Move is protracted over an extended period of time, but it begins with the catching away of the saints of God. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord take place almost at the same time, but they are not the same thing. 
The day of Christ is for the day of Christ, Christos, to come and get his bride. All the new Bibles, there may be an exception here or there, I don't know. But all that I've ever seen changes this scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 to make it say this. And the day of the Lord. And my friend, the day of the Lord is not the same as the day of Christ. Notice why it's so important to get this right. Look at the text carefully. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verses 1 and 2, Be not soon shaken in mind, troubled neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, who? The Antichrist, the son of perdition. And then he continues on by telling you who he is. So that day of Christ will not come except a falling away first. Now, if I make this the day of the Lord, then what have I done? I've rammed the church right into the tribulation period. For the tribulation period is when the Antichrist rises to prominence. And so I've got the church of the living God in the tribulation period looking for the coming of the Antichrist. And that's not going to work because what you've done is connected it with the day of the Lord. The church is never connected with the day of the Lord. The church is connected with the day of Christ, not the day of the Lord. And the day of Christ means that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is alive at any time on this earth when he can come and catch up his bride to meet him in the clouds. How can that be, preacher? This is John the Baptist. He's Elijah if you'll receive him. Remember that? This is John the Baptist. He's Elijah if you'll receive him. So there's a man alive right now who may be nothing more than just another wicked man. But when he is incarnate by Satan, after suffering a deadly blow to the head, he will become incarnate by Satan. Plain of words, raised from the dead. When that moment takes place, he becomes the son of perdition. For the first period of his ministry, if you want to call it that, he's the man of sin. Then he's the son begotten by perdition, son of perdition. That's coming, folks. That's coming. There are people alive right now that are fully qualified to be the Antichrist. You've been watching him for years. That is an Antichrist. He may not be the Antichrist, but he is an Antichrist. And it doesn't take much to understand that this man that I'm talking about, and you all know who I'm talking about tonight, is an Antichrist. He's against Christ, he's against Israel, and he's against your Bible. He's made fun of your Bible, he's mocked it, he's made fun of it, and he's and let you know that he has nothing but contempt for this blessed book. So, he is an Antichrist. Will he be the Antichrist? That's up to God. He's the only one that knows that. But he's preparing us for something. And so I want you to notice what it says in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, it talks about the rise of four kingdoms. Daniel 8. Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. These four kingdoms relate to the successive Gentile kingdoms that rule the earth. And folks, uh, historians tell us that there have only been four Gentile kingdoms to ever rule the earth. Babylon, Medio persia Grecia, and Rome. That's all that has ever ruled the world, the known world, the civilized world, and they have. So therefore that prophecy is pointing to the coming of the end of the Gentile kingdoms. Now let's look at it carefully. I want you to see something in the scripture that relates to this. In Daniel 8, 23 and 25, in the latter time of the kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Daniel chapter number 7, verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, of this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. In Daniel chapter number 8 and verse number 9, he elaborates further and says, Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. 
The pleasant land is a direct reference to Israel. So this Antichrist will hate Israel. He'll hate the Jew, but he will make a peace treaty with them because he wants power. So in Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12, the Old Testament prophesies of the man. Let's understand the essence of Satan. Satan is a spirit being. To be particular, he's a cherub. He's the anointed cherub that covereth. But you understand that spirit beings can animate life in a physical body. Spirit beings are capable of controlling and possessing human bodies. Spirit beings have a lot of power that we still don't understand. But I do believe this. I believe according to Revelation chapter number 13 that when the man of sin suffers a deadly wound and that he comes back to life mimicking the resurrection of Christ that he becomes the son of perdition. He is literally at that moment Satan incarnate in flesh. And we call him the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13 calls him the beast. And he's referred to over and over and over again in the book of Revelation as the beast. He is a man that is literally Satan incarnate. Now for the sake of time, there's a lot that I could say about all this, but for the sake of time, I want to point to the fact that at the second coming of Christ, not the rapture, but the revelation, when he comes at the end of the tribulation period, he's coming to have a personal encounter with the beast. He's coming to meet him face to face, Satan incarnate in flesh. This is one of the reasons that the Bible says when he comes, he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. And he comes to take by his own authority the kingdoms of this world. Look what happens to Satan incarnate in flesh. Isaiah 14 and verse number 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms? He's going to call him out and he's going to take him personally and he's going to bring them in front of all those that have followed him. And in verse number 18 of Ezekiel chapter number 28, it tells you it's talking about the same one, Satan incarnate in flesh. And here's what it says about him. In Ezekiel 28 verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. When the Lord Jesus comes back, he's going to take the Antichrist, which is Satan incarnate, He's going to bring him down to the ground and they're going to watch his body literally consumed before their very eyes. And the body is going to be consumed because of the glory of the countenance of the Son of God. For he may do it this way. He may allow this creature to get a glimpse of his glory. And by allowing him to get a glimpse of his glory, the same thing will happen to him that happened to any Old Testament saint that said, I've seen God, I'm going to die. <laughs> and when God said to Moses, well, who wanted to see his glory, the Lord said, you can't do that, but I'll let my goodness pass before you. And he put him in the cleft of the rock, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. And he moved before him and allowed Moses to see his back parts, his backside, as he moved and God proclaimed his righteousness, his holiness, and his judgment on mankind. We in the flesh cannot stand to look upon the glory of God. We cannot do it, but one day we will do it. And one day when we do see that glory, all the questions you ever had in this world, all the doubts and the nagging problems, everything that may have cut you to your soul and bothered you in this world that you're wanting answers for there, as you've heard it said so many times before, when you see that glory, you it won't matter. It won't matter. For the Apostle John said, we shall see him as he is. But he's got a lot of preparation to do for us before he can bring us into that. And folks, you, we're talking about God Almighty. <laughs> we're talking about the eternal, the eternal one. 
And we're talking about him allowing his glory to just literally float down on your soul. You know what happened in Isaiah chapter number 6, don't you? In Isaiah chapter number 6, when Isaiah the prophet was brought in there, Isaiah chapter number 6, he said the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And here's what he said. He said, his train filled the temple. Well, the train he's talking about literally is the glory falling down from the back of him and moving like a, like, like a bride as she comes in and walks here. And you've seen, I've seen brides with train uh, 5, 10, 15 feet long. And that train, you know, is what follows the bride. That's what we're talking about in Isaiah. It's the glory of God just falling down. And the cherubim were there and the seraphim were there and they were flying with coals upon the altar and they were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. So the Antichrist wants power and he wants authority and he thinks he's something until he comes face to face with Almighty God. Folks, you don't want to fight God. <laughs> you don't want to fight him. You don't want to fight him. You don't want to fight him. <laughs> I, remember, I remember, oh boy, a few years back uh, when it talked about Jacob at Peniel wrestling with the Lord. You know, he read that scripture and he said, what do you mean? He, he said, you think I could wrestle with God? <laughs> Who am I? For, you know, we're talking, the preacher was saying, you know, we wrestle with the Lord. He said, what are you talking about wrestle with God? Why, well, he'd, he'd do me in in a heartbeat. And that's the truth. Except that he can't do you in. You see, that's the good thing about the nature of God. One little shaking hand that reaches up and touches the hem of his garment brings forth from the Almighty mercy and grace. By his very character, he can't push you away. Amen. Amen. By his mercy and his grace, he can't do it. So in Revelation 19, verse 19, the Bible said, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse against his army. The beast was taken, with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them to receive the mark of the beast and them that worshiped as him. And they were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed, the wicked one, the Antichrist, watch this, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the glory. And so the Bible says in Daniel 7 and 11, I beheld till then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, watch this, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And that's exactly what happens at the second advent. Now today they just met for an arid summit. Today. They met for an Arab summit. They just met. The purpose of that summit was so that Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the, Uni and the United Arab Emirates and some other Arab countries would join forces to fight against ISIS. But not only ISIS, but against Iran that is reaching out all over the Middle East, all the way to Lebanon. Hezbollah is a Shiite terror organization funded by Iran. And Iran has stepped into the fray a long time ago into Syria and they have supported, Iran has supported the uh, Bashar Assad. All right? And they are supporting him. And the reason they're doing this is because Iran sees the vacuum in the Middle East that has developed because all these American troops have been pulled out and all these American troops have been pulled out. You have an enormous vacuum. Who's going to rule this place? Who's going to lead this place? And it didn't take them any time to overrun Iraq. And they have over, and already uh, they, 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 the Saudi Arabia is already sending their jets up to bomb them. They're scared to death. So far, most of what's coming out of the, of the Middle East is that this is against, uh, that what's going on here is against ISIS. But folks, this is only part of what's happening. This is against Iran. And what we've got now is nation against nation. There is, there's, there's, a, there's far more military capability in Iran than there is with ISIS. Iran has a military. They have a navy. They've got an air force. They've got a formidable military machine over there. So does Egypt. So does Saudi Arabia. 
These are nation states now that are involved in this thing and they're coming against each other. And so the whole Middle East is a cauldron, a boiling, and it's coming to a point, boiling point when something's going to give. And what's happening is that the President Obama has made this secret deal with Iran to allow them to develop nuclear capabilities in rich uranium. But Iran says it's only for peaceable, sir, peaceable use, peaceful use, that they don't intend to make a bomb. How many believes that? And the sad thing is that, that Mr. Obama has the contempt to think that we're so stupid that we believe it. I don't believe it for a minute. The theology of the Shiite Muslim is different from the theology of the Sunni Muslim. When Muhammad died, 600 and something A.D., his grandson Ali received the authority from his grandfather to rule over the Islamic world. But there was a breach. You had those who wanted a caliphate. And they followed that. And so therefore, there was a split that took place after the death of Muhammad that created what's called Sunni Muslim and Shiite Muslim. And that's the simple, this is a simple, this is a, a simplification because both branches have branches off of them. But Sunni Muslim and Shiite Muslim, they have never liked each other. They have fought each other. They have warred against each other ever since the creation of the, uh, the, se the separation of these two groups. The Shiite Muslim looks in particular for a Mahdi. A Mahdi to them is like a Messiah to the Jew. He is supposed to come back and elevate them to a place of supremacy and bring in the control of the world that the Shiite is looking for. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, when he was the Prime Minister or President of Iran, firmly believed that a conflagration, some kind of a world upheaval, some kind of a, some kind of a war was necessary to bring the Mahdi back. So what you've got is a religion that believes that it's necessary to kill you, blow you up, tear down all of the, of the borders around them, and create as the worst war possible so they can bring back their Mahdi. And when he comes back, he's going to come back, and with him is going to come the prophet Jesus. And the prophet Jesus is going to tell the world of Christians like us that we are wrong, that Christianity is wrong, that the prophet Jesus is a Muslim, and that we need to convert to Islam, and that we got it wrong from the start. And Mohammed was right what he said about the prophet Jesus in 600 and something A.D. when he wrote the Koran. And so the Shiite Muslim has a theology that's different from the Sunni Muslim. And because of this difference in their theology, they don't like each other. They fight each other and they go after each other all the time. Never in my lifetime have I ever seen the, the Sunni and the Shiite rise up like they are right now fighting against each other. That's, folks, listen. This is not a political struggle over there in the Holy, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. This is a religious struggle. This is one religion against another religion. And I'll tell you this, from my experience and what I've read in the past, there is no war and no battle that is fought more intensely than a religion against a religion. That is the most intense war that can possibly be fought. So right now, right now, the Lieutenant General says, when Chris Wallace asked him, he said, now General, he said, what would you do? What would you do if you were in John Kerry's shoes and Obama's shoes, what would you do? He said, I would stop immediately any negotiations with Iran to give them nuclear capabilities. I would step back. I would reassess the whole situation. I'd take a good long look at what's going on over there in the Middle East. He said, I know that what's happening in that place right now is a product of the fact that these people no longer, they no longer trust us. The ones that used to be our allies don't trust America. 
It's everywhere over there. They can't trust us. Let me give you an example. The Muslim Brotherhood overthrew Hosni Mubarak, who was the president of Egypt. They overthrew him. And Obama welcomed the Muslim Brotherhood into the White House. Hosni Mubarak had been a friend of America. He'd been a friend for decades of America. But the moment that the Muslim Brotherhood overthrew, and, I, and some say that, uh, that uh, CIA and some American might have had some, a hand in what happened over there. Uh, you know, that's a different study in itself, and I wouldn't put anything past them. <laughs> but but when, he was, when, when they overthrew the president, locked him up in jail, that the Muslim Brotherhood moved into the White House. The Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. But since then, the military has overthrown the Muslim Brotherhood. And they have, uh, they've, uh, they've imprisoned some of them and, and, and uh, ex executed some of them. And now they appear to have a president over there in Egypt that's concerned about his country and loves his people and loves his country. And that's an honorable thing. It's an honorable thing when you find any leader of a country who loves his people and loves his country and wants to see to their welfare, that's what he's supposed to do. So why do people hate Benjamin Netanyahu? Because he loves his people, he loves his country, and he's fighting for Israel. He's fighting for Israel. So we have right now a ticking time bomb. Here's why it's important. When the Antichrist comes to power, he will come to power through a peace treaty. He's able to show the world that he can make peace. By showing the world that he can make peace, he's showing them, I'm the leader you need. And the world will be ready for peace. We're on the verge now of everything blowing up. What would it be? What would what would happen if a nuclear weapon were detonated somewhere over there in the Middle East? For example, what if Iran? What if Iran? Uh, Israel strikes Iran. What if they strike them for their own survival, and the United States shoots down Israeli fighter bombers in the process of striking Iran? That is an act of war. I don't know if Mr. Obama has thought about that or not. But you shoot down a military aircraft on a mission, you have declared war on that country. Just the other day, unprecedented, this had never happened before, the Obama administration releases this information about a study that was done 10, 15, 20 years ago about the nuclear capability of Israel at Demona. And that study that re was released has been released now for the whole Arab world and the rest of the world to see that Israel has nuclear capability. Up until this point, Israel has never officially acknowledged that they have nuclear capability. Although it has always been understood, they sell technology to the world, folks. It has always been understood that they, that they do have. This is a huge deal for the Obama administration to reveal to the world that Israel has nuclear capability. What's the point in that, preacher? The point is this. If Israel has nukes, then why couldn't Iran have nukes? But Saudi Arabia, the king of Saudi Arabia has already said in the last few days, if Iran has nukes, we want nukes. So what we have then is, a, is an arms race where these countries over there that are worried about their survival and their borders are all in a nuclear arms race, all of it kicked off by Mr. Obama, who will be gone in less than 24 months. And look what he'll hand you. He will hand the world a boiling pot, a time bomb, if it hasn't already exploded by then. He'll hand the world exactly what the world needs for somebody to come in and sign a peace treaty. Now, what would you do if they shoot down an Israeli jet that's bombing Iran? American jet shoots down an Israeli jet, thus declaring war against Israel. How would you feel about that? Here's one thing that Mr. Obama has not considered. There are millions of people in this country 
who are adamantly pro-Israel. Israel has been our friend for decades. Ever since Harry Truman in 1948 recognized Israel as a sovereign nation, and believe it or not, lo and behold, the, the, the uh, foreign minister from Russia seconded it. Or he was the one who made this. I don't know which one it was, but they were Johnny on the spot to recognize Israel as a sovereign nation. They have been our friend. But Obama is very good at throwing our friends under the bus and catering to our enemies. So what would we do? The promise to Abraham is, I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curseth thee. I would have a hard time sleeping at night knowing that our jets are bombing Jerusalem. And you can get ready for this. There are many in the military who absolutely would say, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not going to bomb the Jewish people and the Jewish state. There are many Christians in the military. So this man with his one-sided view of, uh, of uh, diplomacy and uh, his legacy and what he wants to get done over there because he is pro-Muslim, pro-Arab, always has been. Everybody knows that. Uh, and he's making it obvious now. Uh, he's, gonna do, he's, got, he's got his agenda that he's going to push through. He's not running for re-election. And so he's going, to, he's going to do everything he intends to do in the next, uh, what has he got, 20 months? Now to January 19, in 2017, uh, uh, he goes out. Uh, he's going to do all of this uh, before he leaves office. But in the process of doing it, he's going to drag this world right in to World War III. And he's going to drag it in. And maybe he, he intends then to go in and make peace. If he does, we're ready to go. Because we're leaving here. And as I said this morning, there's only one angel in all the Bible that stands for a nation. And he just happens to be an archangel. And that's Michael. That's in Daniel 12. So there is no F-22 aircraft carrier uh, whatever else armament you got, bomb. There's nothing that you're going to use against an archangel. But he can flat wipe you from the face of the earth. <clears throat> I've, um, I don't know if you've ever seen what's called spontaneous human combustion. How many have ever seen that? One in particular is a woman. It shows, it shows part of her leg, about this much, her foot and her leg. Perfect. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this leg until it gets to a certain point. And then all of a sudden, from there on up, it's all burned up. And the fire did not come from the outside. The fire came from the inside. Spontaneous human combustion. It's a, it's a real enigma. A lot of theory about why, what happens and so forth and so on, you know. Uh, who knows? I, d I don't know. I, don't, I just know that their body's consumed. Uh, but I do know this. I do know that when Herod got up and gave a speech over there in the book of Acts. And they said, this is the voice of a God. He didn't rebuke them over it. He did like Mussolini. Have you ever seen Mussolini in World War II? Boy, <laughs> strutting his stuff. You ever see him at the end there when they had him hanging upside down out there in the square with his mistress? Uh, Herod, the Bible said, God smote him. And the worms ate him, that were eating on him by the time he hit the ground. They were eating on him just that fast. That was a supernatural death. It makes me wonder sometimes if uh, when some people are just struck down and they're gone, that the Almighty says, I've had enough of you. <laughs> Zap. <laughs> Where would you go? Who would you run to if the Almighty's going to, he's going to, if he's going to strike you down, son, you're gone. <laughs> You don't even have time to get it right. You're finished. This I told you before. The, the, the destiny of the Antichrist is to be struck down in front of his followers. And a fire comes forth from the inside and consumes his body 
But then he, the Antichrist, is not the body, he's a spirit being, is taken and cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. There he'll be. Aren't you glad tonight that the church of God's leaving out of here? Amen. That's the mystery. We're not all asleep, but we should be changed in a moment, yes. a twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah to God. Yes. Amen. Never thought I'd see it. I never thought I'd see it. I never thought I'd see what's going on right now, the way they're turning against Israel. I didn't. I never thought I'd see it. It's unbelievable, but I can't deny what's happening. They are turning against Israel. God help them. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. I pray for this country, Lord. I pray for the leadership of this country. Lord, you know that America has millions and millions of people in it that love Israel. They love him. They love you, Lord. They love our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that. You know it's not them that's doing this. My Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you do what you intend to do, Lord, and you will bring these things to pass. You make no mistakes. You worketh all things after the counsel of your own will. And I pray that in Jesus' name. But I pray, Father, most of all tonight, I pray even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In thy sweet holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen. Let's stand up tonight.